the lakes, the big ones, five of them forming a huge inland sea of fresh water stretching across the heartland of the continent. A heartland of fertile plains surrounding the waters of the lakes. A homeland for the millions who live and work near the lakes. Until a generation ago, commercial fishing was one of the big attractions around here, and a lot of people made their living from it. Things have changed since then, but some of the more persistent ones are still trying to earn a living catching fish. In the Saginaw Bay area of Lake Huron, they go on setting shallow trap nets but catches have become as unpredictable as the lake weather. They're still getting yellow perch, northern pike, carp, and catfish, but their catches are smaller, and they have to work a lot harder to get them. And they work a lot longer, too. On Lake Huron, they still go after whitefish using deep traps. These are about the best of the lake fish left, and so bring a good price, if you can find them. No matter how small the catch, the undersized ones go back. That's the law. Plenty of ice keeps the fish fresh. Off Ashland, Wisconsin, on Lake Superior, they do their fishing just offshore. They're using a pound net, a type of trap. A variety of mighty good fish are taken out of the cold, clean waters of these northern lakes. They have to be sorted for market. It's a different lake. The gear is similar, but the problem is the same. Not enough fish to make it pay. Lake Ontario has never had much commercial fishing, but now there's less than ever. They're using fight nets. Don't ask me why they still use this old gear. Maybe they figure the fish are used to it by now. You won't catch many fish with fike nets, but then there aren't many fish left. The states are trying to improve the fishing. Size limits are set and the seasons are regulated, but the fishing hasn't shown much improvement. Well, the fish are changing. How about the people? This is Catfish Kate. Now, I wouldn't say she's a typical fisherman, but she can outfish most men. She works out of Bayport on Lake Huron. Kate's husband is the skipper of a fishing boat, but with things the way they are, she has to help out. Her gear is a variation of the old hook and line. These trot lines can have hundreds of hooks. It's good gear for catfish because they get to be pretty big. They're not the prettiest fish, but they're mighty good eating. Kate can pull and set a thousand hooks a day, 
and she has to these days just to make a few dollars over expenses. But it's a healthy life. Even the old reliable beach seine isn't producing the catches it once did. About a mile of net is towed out into the lake and then hauled back. Erie is a shallow lake, so this kind of gear works fine. A beach seine costs plenty. Nowadays, it takes hard work and luck just to cover overhead and labor. Not only are the catches smaller, but they're usually made up of fish that can be used only for animal feed or industrial products. Many beach sayings are family operations that have been handed down from generation to generation. But unless they can be made to pay, the fishermen will quit and the valuable beachfront property will be handed over to other interests. The time is early winter. The place is Grand Marais, Minnesota, on the far side of Lake Superior. And it's cold here. They have to be hardy, almost foolhardy, to fish in this kind of weather. But they do. They don't have any choice if they're after Lake Herring, because this is when the herring runs. They're using gill nets. A lot of fishermen on the lakes use gill nets. Their fathers and their grandfathers used them, and I guess you could say that gill nets have become sort of a tradition. And it's one tradition that calls for a lot of work. The fish get tangled in the net, and each one has to be worked free by hand. This takes time. Lots of time. They're getting lake herring, but even a good catch of lake herring won't pay for this kind of work. Don't get the idea that we haven't improved any of our fishing methods. After all, we developed the gill net tug. It's not only got a roof and sides to protect the men from the weather, but also a mechanical lifter to haul the net. The only trouble is, we haven't figured out an easy way to get the fish out of the net, so we still have to take them out by hand. But nobody's really worried about this, because we still haven't found a way to get enough fish in the net. fish to make gill netting pay. Fish like lake trout, walleye, and whitefish. But these fish are getting harder to find, even in places like Isle Royal and Lake Superior. This area used to be loaded with lake trout hotspots. Now, even the sportsman has to do a lot of traveling to find them. But for the man who has to make a living, well, you can see for yourself.
If the sports fisherman knows the spots and has what it takes, he can still land a good catch. They may not be as large or as plentiful as they used to be, but there's enough to keep him interested. Years ago, he didn't brag about anything under 10 pounds, and 30 pounders were common. The sea lamprey is the main reason for the disappearance of the lake trout. It may look like an eel, but it isn't one, and it doesn't act like one. Once this vicious, beady-eyed monster attaches itself, hardly ever can the fish shake it off. It feeds like a vampire, with its sucker-like mouth locked onto its victim. Its horny teeth and rasping tongue cut through the scales and skin to get at the blood and other body fluids. It usually doesn't stop feeding until its victim is lifeless. And the sad part of all this is that the lamprey doesn't belong in the lakes. It's a sea creature that got into the lakes by way of the Welland Canal. And then spread into the upper lakes where it multiplied, feeding on the big trout. And when these began to get scarce, it started on the large chubs and whitefish. The smelt, like the lamprey, is another foreigner in the lakes. Some fish may be disappearing, but there's certainly no shortage of smelt, particularly in Lake Michigan. Each year, we get more and more of them. Maybe this is another sign the lakes are changing. In the spring, most of the lakes are swarming with these pretty little fish, and you can catch all you want. The big job is to get a decent price for them. Even when the lakes are frozen, you can still get smelt. Just set your net under the ice a few miles offshore, and then go out, cut ice, and haul net in sub-zero weather. With smelt come troubles. When they're running, the fishermen bring in so many that the market is glutted. But even when they're not running, smelt aren't easy to sell. Many people don't appreciate these tasty little fish. In the spring, when the smelt are running, you can catch them at night, too, and everyone joins in. Fifty years ago, there wasn't a smelt in the lakes. Then someone got the idea of trying to stock the lakes with Atlantic salmon. They brought the smelt from Maine to serve as food for the salmon. The salmon didn't take, but the smelt did. And today, they're one of the most plentiful fish in the lakes. So plentiful, in fact, that some fishermen have begun to worry. Neither the lamprey nor the smelt would be here if we hadn't helped. And it makes you wonder how many other problems man brought to the lakes. I guess it started when we began clearing the land around the lakes. There was plenty of timber, and we cut it and used it. We burned a lot, too. We got rid of the trees, all right, and changed millions of acres of watershed. Then we started on the land, plowing under the grass to make the fields productive. Productive, 
and bare and unprotected. The wind, the rain, and the melting snows did the rest. And millions of tons of topsoil flowed into the lakes, changing depths, lifting water temperatures, and covering the life on the bottoms. On the surface, the lakes looked the same as ever, and few noticed the changes. But there were plenty of changes, and soon you couldn't help noticing them. Towns and cities grew and spread and spilled out over the whole region. Houses everywhere. And before we knew it, we had almost half the people of the country living here. Living and playing here. And the beautiful lakes make a perfect playground. They come from all over the country. There's always plenty to do. And if you just want to relax, there's always fishing. And this recreation is important to millions whether they're angling for smallmouth bass in Green Bay, walleyes in Bay de Noc, herring at St. Ignace, or muskies in Lake St. Clair. All this is in jeopardy. Fewer fish for sports fishermen, fewer fish for commercial fishermen. There were other changes too, as we went on to find other uses for the lakes and the land around them. Materials, markets, and labor were here. And so we started putting up plants and factories, plants to generate power and plants to use it. Mills for smelting ore and turning out steel and mills to use it. Factories for all the products people need and a lot they don't need. With the lake supplying millions of gallons of fresh water to quench the great industrial thirst and for a waterway to boot. Put all of this together, and over the years, it adds up to a lot of wear and tear on the lakes. Enough to take a lot out of them. But judging from the looks of the lakes in some areas, we were also dumping a lot back in. Sewage, chemicals, industrial wastes, and just plain garbage. Maybe it doesn't look like much, but it pours in and it adds up. Sometimes you could see it. Often, you could smell it. And now and then, you'd see the results. But the fish weren't the only ones affected by all these changes. The fishermen were the first to suffer. And in many fishing towns, ghostly relics are all that's left. You had to be an optimist to try to sell a fishing boat. And as for a fish processing plant, what would anyone do with it? And if you're patient and have the time, you can hope and wait for the fish to come back. A lot of fishermen are still waiting and working at other jobs to pay the bills. For most of them, the change was gradual, with more and more time spent on outside work as fishing earnings dropped. But even with full-time jobs, the hard-headed ones go on fishing. Others go on fishing because they have no choice. They spent their whole lives working with boats and nets and they're too old for change. Fishing is all they know. So they go on with their work, supporting themselves as best they can, waiting for the big fish to come back, and talking about the old days. It's hard for the young ones to believe the stories they hear, stories of large catches, 
and of enormous trout. Among themselves, the old timers still ask, what happened? And they recall strange things they have never been able to explain. Were these warnings? Today they all complain about the changes, but they can't agree on what caused them. But the big question is not what happened, but what's going to happen. One thing is certain, a lot has to happen if commercial and sports fishing on the lakes is to improve or even survive. And it has started to happen. With the backing of the states around the lakes, the federal government and Canada, the fishermen are trying new methods. One they're testing is the trawl, and some states have issued special authorization so that this gear can be used on an experimental basis. The big advantage of trawling is that it eliminates a lot of the handwork required by the older methods and provides an economical way of taking the lower priced fish. A single trawler can catch large quantities of fish with very little hand labor. And because the trawl can be fished selectively in the kinds of fish it catches, its use promotes the growth of desirable fish by removing those that are overcrowding the lakes. Trawling helps maintain a balance, a balance beneficial to both commercial fishermen and sports fishermen. While most of these fish are not sold now for human consumption, they can be used for a variety of products. And experts are convinced that with the right kind of gear, the handling of these underutilized fish can be made into a profitable operation. Mink farms are already using some of this fish, and they'll probably be using a lot more. There are many fur farms near the lakes, and they have become big year-round markets for underutilized lake fish. And even larger quantities can be used by manufacturers of pet food for shipment to all parts of the country. Technologists are trying to broaden the market for lake fish by finding new uses for them. They found that the fish are rich in food elements and can be used in many new ways. The lakes themselves are being studied and the Bureau of Commercial Fisheries keeps floating laboratories moving around the lakes, learning about the movements of the fish, their feeding habits, and other valuable information which is passed on to help sports fishermen as well as commercial fishermen. For some time now, government, with the help of industry, has been working to control the lamprey and they've found a method. They wait until the lamprey come into the streams to spawn and then destroy their lava. It took years to find chemicals that would kill the lamprey lava without harming the fish, but they finally came up with the right combination. And it works. All those young ones are dead. But there are still plenty of those wily monsters getting into the lakes, and it's going to be hard to get rid of them. In the meantime, the United States and Canada go on stocking the lakes, stocking them with lake trout. Hatcheries are also experimenting with other fish that might be able to live in the special environment of the various lakes. We are also trying to develop bigger markets for the fish we have. With the bones out, fish are easier to eat and easier to sell. That's why we freeze some of the fish, because then we'll be able to sell them all year and all over the country. We've never canned much of our lake fish, but we're seriously thinking about doing it now. This would be a way to have a year-round market.
smoked fish have been a delicacy to folks around the lakes for years. But there are a lot of people all over the country who have never tried it. It's our fault, and we're trying to correct it. If we're successful, we'll broaden the market. One reason more people don't eat our Great Lakes fish is that they don't know about them. And we're taking care of that, too. We're telling and showing them every way we know. Schools and other public institutions can become big users of lake fish. They need healthful food. And when it comes to nutrition, you can't beat fish. You can't beat them for taste, either. And speaking of taste, we've never had to do much promoting of our lake fish in the good restaurants. Some of them built their reputations on lake trout and whitefish and have special ways of preparing them. We're encouraging restaurants to go to work on some of our other fish. And in spite of our troubles, we still have a fair variety of them. We've got the variety all right. In fact, things are beginning to look brighter for those who look to the lakes for recreation or for a way to earn a living. The lakes have changed, and they're still changing. But now, we're learning to change with them. And with all we're doing, all we plan to do, things are bound to get better for everyone using this great natural resource. The lakes we have today are not the lakes of 200 years ago, or even 50 years ago. But they're still the Great Lakes, and when all the results are in, they will be greater than ever.